Okay, thank you for doing that. Good morning, everyone. This is a <laughs> meeting of the Concord Middle School Building Committee. It is Friday, November 5th already, and approximately 7.30 in the morning. And I will call this meeting to order. Stephen Crane, are you with us today? Present. Hi, Stephen, good morning. Jared Stanton? Present. Hi, Jared, Matt Johnson. Present. Hi, Matt. Uh, Lori Hunter. Present. Justin Cameron. Present. Uh, John Harris. Present. Russ Hughes. Present. Peter Fischelis. Present. Alexa Anderson. I think Alexa's with us. She's on an airplane. She let me know that <laughs> she may not be able to, to verbally communicate. So I, we may not get a present from her, but I asked her if she has comments to please chat. Um, if she's able to. So, uh, Court Booth. Present. Heather Bow. Right here. Hi, Heather. Frank Cannon. Yes. Thank you. Chris Popoff. Present. Good morning, Chris. Charlie Parker. Yes. Matt Root. Good morning, everyone. Present. Good morning. Pat Nelson. Yes, I'm here. And Don Goriello. I am present. So, let's call this meeting to order. Uh, our first order of business is approval of minutes, but I'm just realizing, I don't know that we saw those. Yeah, so, I think we had the ones from the, the two, two meetings ago. The seventh, is that the one, has it been that long that I've forgotten that I reviewed them? Anyone? Um, I think that's probably the case. I, I'm in the same well, boat. Well, given what we, Unless anyone has any objections, I'd suggest we table that um, just in the interest of time with so much to talk about today. Um, unless anyone objects, I'm going to suggest we do that. And everyone dig them out of your inbox or your folders, whatever you've done with them, and we'll, we'll look at them next week. We've got a meeting a week from today. So uh, correspondence. Heather. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Um, okay, so I'll do quick correspondence, and then at the same time, Don, did you want me to do a quick, <clears throat> sorry, a quick update on communications and everything that's going on? Please, yep, we're going to put those under the same umbrella today, if that's okay with everyone. So Heather will report out on correspondence as well as uh, speak to the um, the communications. Yep, Please, absolutely. Okay, so correspondence first. We didn't have um, a large volume, but we had uh, a few emails. One was just soliciting estimating services, which of course we didn't still need. Um, we had a question on access to the estimation uh, documents, which are now available and online. Um, we had outreach from the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, just asking um, really status and to be involved again. And so Pat has since, oh yes, last night attended their meeting. Um, so this is a nice example of just kind of working with the community and different community groups that are reaching out to us and that we're touching base with. Um, we also got a letter from CPAC uh, just yesterday, so I hope everybody has taken a look at it um, with a basically recommendations as to what they find to be non-negotiable in the schematic design, um, which I think is in reference to as we go forward over the next few weeks and have to do value engineering. So that's really important to look at as we uh, go through this process. Um, unless anyone else saw anything that I'm missing in that list. I think that was it for actual correspondence since the last meeting. Um, so then I will do a just a quick kind of high level update on communications. I will keep it quick because I know we have a big agenda today. Um, but I wanted to first update on the last two forums. I know people have been curious to hear what was said and commented at those forums um, if they weren't able to attend. So just in terms of quick high level of comments, kind of summary of comments. Um, the, the last two, there was one of September 23rd um, and there were actually not all that many comments and questions and about half of them were, thanks for all your work. This is a great job. We're really excited for it. So there's a lot of thanks coming from the community, which is really nice. Um, there were some comments specific to auditorium and um, you know the, the shape of it, asking it to be wide, not deep chairs, not bleachers, that kind of thing. There were questions about the design of the solar panels, um, questions about uh, 
choir classroom, chorus classroom, and where that would be held. So there was discussion of the auditorium. Um, a question about whether the building will be fully hardwired, uh, which has come up multiple times. So I know we need to address that. Um, and, and then all of the things. So that was it for the 23rd. Then on October 28th, just last week, we had another one. Um, again, there were several comments of thanks and appreciation for what we're doing. Um, the other comments, there was a question about our meeting times and whether we're going to continue to meet at 7.30 a.m. Um, there was a strong plea to not take a scalpel to this project once we have to start value engineering. Um, a comment that there, has, there have been compromises already and that this is a building that the community wants. Um, another comment asking for no further cuts. Um, questions about the gym and auditorium and basically how they benefit both the educational experience of the students and also the community. Um, so there was, a lot of, there was a lot of insight into that. And then a couple of follow-up comments from other people about um, basically just kind of community comments saying there are many community uses of gym and auditorium um, and that chorus groups and everything use it during the day. Um, and finally, a question about funding in terms of what are Concord's other imminent obligations and what private funding options can we look at? So there was there were obviously responses and discussion to all that, but those are the highlights of the questions that came up. Um, comments or questions on that? Anything that I missed from those who were there at the forums? Okay. I think it's just, the, sorry, I was just gonna note, there were probably 25 to 30 participants um, just as a order of magnitude so that folks know, which, yep. Um, so I, th I think that's a pretty good turnout, you know, which is we were, pretty good. I will say, you know, yeah. we used to do all of these in person and if we had 20, we were ecstatic. So, <laughs> right. um, so I think 25 to 30 perform for forum is a, is a great turnout and it really shows the community is engaged in this project right now where even if we're not getting a lot of specific emails and correspondence, the community is engaging in various ways. Um, which actually leads me right into the next part of the update because we're now in the middle of a lot of, uh, we'll just summarize them as events, but community forums, coffees, basically outreach opportunities for the whole community. Um, so what's going on right now is um, in addition to the forums, we've started to have a couple of coffees uh, and we have a lot more coming up in the next couple of weeks. So you might not have, as a committee, you probably haven't seen the announcements for all of them because several of them are with specific groups. Um, we have had a couple of general ones. We held a coffee outdoor at the library the other day and had a couple of people. Um, you know, we don't expect 20 to 25 for something like that. Um, but the few people who show up, sometimes you get two or three for these, sometimes four or five. I think they really enjoy that they have a, a, a small discussion and a chance to really uh, engage in this personally and have a deep discussion about the building. Um, so we had a great interactive discussion outside the library the other day. Uh, the ones coming up, we have, um, whoops, I'm sorry, I'm switching windows here so I can see them all. We have coffees set up specifically at Alcott for that community, at Willard for that community, at Thoreau, we're confirming a date. Um, we have one at CMS for CMS families. Um, that one again might be shifting. A, a lot of these dates keep shifting, which is why I'm not showing you an actual full schedule. Um, they are constantly in flux. Uh, um, we have, we are planning a panel discussion on sustainability. So big thanks. I know Martine and Matt are scheduled to be panelists and we'll probably have a couple of others. Uh, and then a few more coffees coming up in the next few weeks that are just general for anybody. We'll have a couple of coffees at Ripley where anyone can come. And then come the week of the 18th, we'll have another forum where we'll discuss the estimates that we're about to go through today. Um, so there's a lot going on. Again, no hard schedule in front of you because a lot of them are shifting, uh, but you will continue to see announcements of what we're doing. And I would say just on average overall in the next few weeks, we have two to three events per week that are going on. So there's a lot of outreach uh, and community engagement happening right now. I need to say a huge thanks to the team who's doing all of these, both the professionals and the chairs and Lori, and I know Justin's been at some, the time is incredible. Um, and Alexa, who's been a huge help in putting all this together. So um, thanks to all those who are involved in the coffees. Um, speaking of Alexa, I hope you're all following our social media channels because 
She's just the queen of social media. I love reading all of her posts. She brings humor into them. Um, and I think people are really in, enjoying how this information is coming across and it's getting right out there about every meeting, every coffee, every event. Um, so the, the information is getting pushed out. I also wanna express thanks to Erin Stevens over at the townhouse who has been also posting on social media when we have events. So she's been a big part of this communications team. Um, overall, you know, there is a lot of communication going out and the town is hearing about this. Um, I see a lot of it going out. That's the feedback that I'm getting. By all means, if, if people hear from people in town who are not hearing about things and not finding these channels, let me know or, you know, have them reach out to me and we'll make sure they get included and that we find other channels to reach everyone. Um, but, but the information is getting out pretty broadly right now. Um, last thing I will quickly update that I know Alexa is close on launching uh, some of those videos. And thank you to those of you who've done videos. Um, that's really exciting. So we're gonna to start to send those out on social media also. Uh, okay, let me just look at my list quickly because I wanna wrap this up for you all. I think that's it, uh, unless there are any questions or uh, Alexa, if you're on and I've missed anything, you're welcome to jump in, but I know you're not at a good point to <laughs> present. So anything else? Alexa, you have a thumbs up. Any questions? All right. No, that that was great. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Alexa. Thank you, everyone who's been involved in anything <laughs> communications related uh, recently. So my favorite, Alexa, was the rooster. <laughs> yeah. like a rooster if you're up with it, because our meetings are so early in the morning. So uh, good humor in there, Alexa. Yep, <laughs> <It's> great. Great. <laughs> um, okay, anything else on correspondence from anyone? Hearing none, we will move on to any new business. Nothing official is listed on our agenda. I will open the floor to anyone who might have anything new business-wise. Hearing none, <laughs> let's move on to the, the meat and potatoes. All right, schematic design. We're, we're here today to talk about the cost estimate, estimates that we got that were reconciled. Uh, a lot of hard work's been done in the last week and a half by our design team and our professionals. Um, so much appreciation for all that they've put into that. Uh, there's one thing I wanted to put out there for anyone in the public that's listening. Um, I wanted to see if there were any objections to taking public comments after the cost estimate in value engineering um, discussion. Being that there's a handful of things on the agenda after, I would consider allowing cost specific and value engineering specific comments after that, after we have our full committee discussion. And then again, having public comments at the end for anything else or anyone that, um, you know, logs back in because our meetings get really long. And some of the feedback I'm hearing is that, you know, to wait until potentially 9 30, 10 o'clock um, and, um, you know, for public comment may not be um, ideal for those in the in the audience listening. So I guess I'd ask if anyone has any objections to that. Otherwise, I would propose that we consider hearing from public comment at the end of our discussion. Sounds good. I'm getting thumbs up and a sound good. Sounds good. Okay. Um, so full transparency, we just want our community to be involved and we want to be respectful of their time as well. And knowing that this is such a important topic, um, I think it's valuable to have a couple of public comments, one right after schematic design. So we're going to get through our conversation, then open it up. We'll finish out our agenda and open it up again um, after um, later on in the agenda before we close. All right. So with that, um, I'm going to, I've already thanked our design team. I know they've done a lot of hard work. I'm not sure if Lorraine or Ian is um, leading this discussion, but I will not be the one to pull the bow off the present and <laughs> present it. Um, Thanks, Don. Well, it's going to be, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll let yep, Lorraine be ready. Santa Claus. <laughs> no, um, Re but ready to go. I'll, uh, <laughs> all joking aside, whoever's screen sharing and whoever's taking over this, um, Part of the agenda feel free to take it away and we'll all listen with bated breath all right without further ado um so we'll, we'll hop into it here i guess i'll walk you through um the process and uh show you some some snapshots along the way here so um 
you know, kudos to the design team for, for putting together the schematic design estimate package. Uh, they met the deadline um, and deliverables. Uh, we got those out uh, the, the eighth um, as planned. And so the estimators had, um, you know, a good two and a half weeks to go through the package and um, put together their estimates. Um, and so they had until the 27th to put together their estimates. We received those on time as well, uh, which was great. And um, so we had two estimators. We had um, PM&C, uh, who was hired by Hill, and we had AM Fogarty, who was hired by SMMA, uh, just to have two different um, opinions uh, from professional estimators on uh, cost. And uh, so we received, again, those estimates last week. We had an opportunity to review them, comment on them, um, scrub them a bit, um, and then and then we really got into the meat of it on Monday of this week uh, with an with a reconciliation meeting, in which we went through the estimates line by line, and we talked about scope, we talked about assumptions, we talked about um, what what each, each estimator was carrying, and um, we were able to reconcile those values between the two estimators so that they were carrying the same scope the same assumptions on everything. Um, and the, the uh, work product for, from that is this reconciled estimate that I have up on the screen here. So- Hey um, Ian, can I just interrupt for one second yep. for, for those in the audience that aren't familiar with this? We see Ian and Lorraine and their team of people that present to us often. There's a whole boatload of professionals behind them, engineers and designers, and, you know, landscape architects, and I mean, we know Mike, he comes to our meeting, but like there's a whole team of professionals, plumbing engineers, um, fire protection, they're all looking at this as well. They're all checking the quantities, they're all checking the scope, and then they all sit through their piece of the reconciliation. So it's important to know that this is a huge deal. This is a huge team effort. And there's a lot of professionals that are working on school projects that are very involved in this process. So I, I, I don't want to sell our team short as far as who's involved in this. So it's more than just like three or four people in a room. It is a, I don't know if you guys did it electron, you know, over Zoom or whatever, but when you do them in person, it's overwhelming. There's a lot of people in the room and lots of conversation about getting on the same page as far as quantities and costs. So just for a little yeah. bit of perspective. No, that's that's a great point. We, we do have a big team behind us. Um, you know, a lot of different layers of, of uh, review and, and um, feedback. So uh, we have a big, big project team that, that helped get us uh, to this point here. So, um, so I guess one thing else to mention here is, um, you know, in addition to the, the estimating process, we also uh, were working on the value management, uh, value engineering process as well, um, in which we had to um, you know, put together a, a list of, of items um, that, that we would propose um, for you guys to consider for uh, changes and um, put together costs, reconciled costs with that. So we were working on that this week as well, um, kind of down, down to the last minute uh, with the estimator. So um, you guys should have received all of those uh, things yesterday. Um, the backup, the full backup to this. Um, but again, I'll go through um, the summary sheet here just to give you a preview. So um, essentially what you have on the screen, you have um, AM Fogarty's estimate um, on the right. So these are the reconciled costs for AM Fogarty on the right. You've got PM and C's uh, estimate down the center here. And then you have what we, uh, consider the reconciled value on the left, and that is, uh, you know, what we what we think is is the appropriate uh, cost to carry here for final construction costs. So, what we did is um, we just took an average of the two. We split the difference between the two estimates because there is a there is a a, a split uh, between the two. There's a difference of um, close to 1.4 million. Um, so we met in the middle there with the, with the reconciled cost estimate. So again, um, getting into the details that, you know, each one of these is, is backed up by a, you know, 30, 40 page estimate, uh, with, with all the details and assumptions. 
So all of this information is rolled up into these sub subcategories. So um, you've got the substructure here, which includes foundations and uh, basement construction. You've got the shell of the building, the superstructure, um, the floor, floor, floor construction, exterior enclosure and roofing um, and all the associated costs uh, with those. We've got the interiors under C. Um, so partitions, interior doors, specialty millwork, uh, stairs, finishes, uh, wall finishes, floor ceiling finishes, um, what you're going to see as, as the final condition inside of the building. We've got uh, D services, so we've got elevators. Um, this is the, the MEP trades here, plumbing, HVAC, fire protection, electrical, and all the associated costs with those. Uh, we've got equipment and furnishings uh, under E. Um, so these are these are um, equipment and furnishings that are attached to the building. So um, using Don's analogy here, any if you can take the building and pick it up and shake it, anything that falls out is uh, not included in this. Anything that's attached is is included here. Um, we have a separate FF and E um, for for other furniture um, in the soft costs as well. So not a duplication of efforts, just two different types of furniture there. Uh, F is special construction for um, build, basically building demolition of the existing buildings, uh, modular and uh, hazardous uh, waste. So all the uh, abatement and removal uh, prior to demolition. And then G is site work. So you've got site preparation, site improvements, utilities and site electric. Um, and then you get into the markups. So um, these are the, the markups uh, below the line for escalation, uh, design and estimating contingency, uh, which is carried at a 10% at a, a um, at this stage in design. Um, Escalation, we, we spent quite a bit of time talking about escalation and, and trying to determine what, what the, the right escalation was uh, for the project. You know, we had been reporting out to the committee that uh, we were carrying 4% per year. Uh, and so that's what PM&C uh, had carried and, and, and agreed on. Um, AM Fogarty had 3.5% per year. So... We had a long discussion about it. Um, we determined that, uh, or agreed, agreed that three and a half was the right number to carry, um, given you know what we know about the market and um, the costs that are that are included in here, um, because the costs in here are are, are today's prices. So, um, so we carried three and a half percent, which which gives you the five point two five um, from now until. Um, until bid time in the spring of 2023. So, um, and then we have uh, general conditions here for the main building, general conditions for the uh, demolition and site work. So we're carrying 24 months for the, for the main building at a higher rate because um, the construction management team is gonna be a bigger, a bigger team, bigger presence on site um, so just more costs associated with that for the main building. And then they're going to, they're going to skinny down their staff for demolition and site work. So we carry a, a lower monthly value for that. Um, we talked about timeline for demo and site work and, and thought it would be best to um, carry two extra months. I know the schedule had five months in there uh, as an assumption. We thought it was tight, a tight window. Uh, so, so we, we ended up changing that to seven months, uh, for cost purposes. But Ian, it's worth General noting that's after, yep. sorry to interrupt, but it's worth noting those seven months are after occupation of the building, after the students are that's, able to. That's right. So for just yep, clarity right. for those who, yeah. So that's after the building is complete, then the students and staff and teachers will occupy the new building and then the old building will come down in those seven months that Ian's referencing is after the building is occupied. Yep, that's right. 
Um, and then general requirements, um, we have 2% carried there, uh, bonds, 1%, insurance, 1%. Uh, we, we assume that there's no um, fees associated with the permitting. Uh, and then we carry 2.5% for uh, overhead and profit, uh, really just profit in this case, uh, given the delivery method. So um, that gets us to the, to the bottom line. You know, AM Fogarty had 83.2 million. Uh, PMC had 81.8 million as their uh, reconciled cost. So you're looking at a difference of 570 versus 579 a square foot. Uh, again, we took the we took the the split um, 82.5, um, which comes out at 574 a square foot. Um, so. Um, some other things to, to note, I kind of went over some of this stuff. Um, we wanted to strip this down to the, to really the, the bear, the base costs here. So one of the things that we did is we, uh, we did not include the displacement ventilation system in the auditorium. Um, I know that was, um, you know, the, the sustainability subcommittee wanted to study that, wanted to have a study that. And so the way, the way that we framed it up is we didn't put it in the base. It's on the VM log. Um, it's in the tune of two hundred thousand dollars. We realized that you guys um, made a recommendation to to study that, and and I think that that's something that you will want to take in the VM log. But that's kind of how we framed it up initially here. Um, I talked about FF and E um, as having more FF and E costs in the in the in the soft cost side, and we'll go through that here. The total project budget. Um, we have security scope. All the security scope is included in these construction costs here. Um, the technology scope is carried under uh, soft costs in the in the total project budget. Um, these are just some assumptions on the existing building demolition square footage, uh, just so we had apples to apples comparison. Uh, the hazardous abatement is per Anobis uh, report uh, for environment. They did an environmental survey and report that that uh, identified all the hazardous materials, asbestos, PCBs, um, other, other hazardous materials in the building that need to be removed prior to uh, demolition. Uh, we agreed, we talked about escalation, the three and a half percent. We talked about the duration of the demolition and fields and, and the fees uh, for permits. So this is kind of the, the uh, summary sheet that, that we do for, uh, all projects for SD estimate level. So any questions on that before I show you how this plugs into the total project? Okay. I have a quick one. I, I just, this is Charlie. I wondered is commissioning in this layout? Where does commissioning fit? Commission. Put it that way. Yep. Yep. It's in, um, uh, It's in 40 right here on in the administrative costs. It's so typically a soft good. cost, Charlie. So it'll be yeah, part it's, of it's the a total. soft cost. Yep. Great. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And one other thing, Ian, this is Peter Martini. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate that um, we've both SMMA and Hill have worked with these estimators before. Um, you know, sometimes we use one, they use one. We're pretty familiar with them. And when we saw their numbers coming in generally on a, on a reconciliation, this is, this is pretty close. I mean, I know we're talking about millions of dollars here, but it's reasonably close. Um, we didn't take lightly the fact that we just, you know, added uh, on their line items, added them up and divided by two for the reconciliation. That isn't something that's always done. I mean, sometimes if you've got down the road, if you've got a contractor involved, sometimes you defer to their number. Um, sometimes you can defer to an architect's number. In this, this case, um, we thought the best way to reconcile the two um, because they had the same scope and understood the project and we had, we had gone through the whole thing with them and there weren't any large differences between them to do the midpoint for all the trades. That's it, thanks. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. So th this is our, um, you know, typical layout for project budget. And so this carries all of the, the hard costs, the construction costs, as well as the soft costs. 
Um, and this is a, a summary level. Um, there's, there's detailed backup to this, um, but for our purposes today, I'm just gonna go through the summary level here. So essentially what you have in, in 20 is- uh, Ian, can I, Ian, can I interrupt for a second and ask you to zoom in a little bit? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. You know, that this information on the on the right isn't too too important now because none of the information's filled out on on cost and cash flow. This is the new budget template, so we're going to focus in over here. You can um, probably make it a little bigger, Ian, because we really after F we don't need to see. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. So walking you through it here, we've got twenty, which is the construction cost. So I took the reconciled cost estimate and plugged it in here, um, the 82.5 million. We've got architectural and engineering costs here at a shade over 8 million. We've got administrative costs here at 4.5 million, uh, FF and E. So again, things uh, above and beyond what was carried in the construction costs for furniture and technology is included here, which gets you to a 97.6 million subtotal uh, we're carrying 5% uh, contingency on construction, 5% contingency on the soft costs, so 30, 40, and 50, which gets you the 4.8 million. Um, total project costs brings it up to 102.5. And this gives you a little more of a background here on what's, what's included. So, um, in the A&E section, you've got SMMA's basic design, design services for the, the design, construction, and closeout. You've got geotech and geo-environmental engineering, uh, surveying, hazardous materials, um, A&E subconsultants, reimbursable costs, printing, and construction testing and inspection. Uh, you've got administrative costs includes uh, the OPM services for design, construction, and closeout. We've got commissioning agent here, advertising and other administrative costs, moving costs, utility fees from the utility companies. Uh, 50 is the FF&E, which is uh, anything not fixed to the building and then technology. Security is not included. It's, a, uh, it's included in the construction costs above. And then again, the contingency is 5% on construction, 5% on uh, soft costs. Uh, which is what we typically carry. So that is um, the summary level uh, total project budget. So I think, um, you know, we talk about we, where-, where Sorry, the, Ian, yeah. can, I, sure. can I interrupt for one second? So that puts us at 102.524.461 in my, the highlighted cell there. Just- That's to, correct. Be really clear, that's the total project cost. So that's hard costs that were described as the reconciled. That's the 82512. Uh, is that a 264? Oh my God, I need glasses after COVID. Uh, 164, 264. <laughs> One, Thank you, 164. Yep. Um, so that's the hard cost. That's all the construction costs. What's in the building? The soft costs on top of that's everything Ian just described, which puts us at a total project cost of 102. 100 million, 102 million, 524,461. So just to be totally clear, that's the TPC right now, total project cost, which is hard costs and soft costs put together. Yep, that's right. Great. That's right. That's Thank right. you. So we, we, um, we presented a couple of weeks ago, just kind of talking through process here. And, um, you know, we're at, a, we're at a point where the, the cost came in over, over the target of 100 million. Um, so we, we have a plan, we have a process for this. Um, I kind of walked you through that before, but essentially, you know, you, you have um, decisions to make um, on the range in, in which is acceptable or, or the final cost that you want to accept here for schematic design and what you want to take to uh, the community. So um, we'll look at the value management log next, but you know, essentially you, there's, you have the option to, to stay uh, at 102 million and say, you know what, we don't want to do anything else. We want to, we don't want to take any value management, value engineering, 
Um, there are a few ads on the on the VE log, so you could you could uh, add those items only. You could get up to you know roughly 3.9 million in total project cost if you take the ads only on the VM log. You could stay at 2.5 million. You could go anywhere in between. We have a um, a VE log uh, a total maximum savings of 3.8 million um, to to choose from. So if you really wanted to, to push the limit and take all 3.8 million, you could get down to um, 98.7 million for total project cost. So you kind of have that range from 3.9 to 98.7 um, with ads and deducts on the VM log. Um, and you need to determine, you know, again, at the end of the day, what you're comfortable with, uh, what you want to bring to the community here. So. This is going to be really hard to see, but um, does everyone have this? Have this was shared around. Yeah, Ian, this this was emailed around to the. I understand those yep. in the audience may not have it, so we'll do our best to share screen and and um, try to read it um, for those in the group that received it, it. If you need to, feel free to open it alongside the screen. Ian, would it be worth opening yep. the Excel file and then just hiding the main columns? just to get it, the description and then the price. Sorry. So we could hide, you know, G through K or all the way over. I mean, that we can open the detail at any time, so. Yeah, it just might be easier to read. Yeah. Um, gone. Yes, Court. Yeah, could could we ask Ian to speak to the the source of this document? Um, is this uh, a first set of recommendations from Hill for possible consideration, or how do these how do these uh, land on our desk? This didn't get uh, generated by this committee. It was, is is this Hill work? Yeah. So th this is again the the entire project team. We put our heads together. We thought of uh, ways to, um, you know, savings measures uh, in addition to, um, there's some ads on here, uh, uh, things that you, that you might want to select related to ventilation uh, in the building, because um, we know that, that that's been an ongoing conversation with the sustainability committee. Um, but yeah, this, this is our, our first pass, the project team's first pass at putting together a list of items that we think are, are good for you guys to consider um, for value engineering, value management. But just to clarify, so this, you know, yeah. this is not, this list is not, a, we don't recommend taking all of the items on this list. There are things on this list that are, you know, integral to design, integral to the program. What, you know, our charge is to get to your budget and to get options to get there. Um, so, you know, we, we don't, put items on this list lightly. We understand that decisions have been made. You know, a lot of the items on here are respect to finishes, longevity, operating costs over years, um, maintenance costs. So I, I would say from SMMA's perspective, we, don't, we do not recommend all the items on this list. We can absolutely give you what our recommendations are, but we know that we need options and we need to talk about what those options are. And we need to all collectively understand that if we take some of these decisions, what are the trade-offs and what are the pros and cons of those decisions? Because some of them do impact, you know, operating costs for the project, for the school and for the district moving forward. I think it's also worth noting along the way, whether it was subcommittee meetings or conversations amongst the greater group, that things were asked for as a line item in the estimate. And are some of those, am I speaking correctly, Lorraine and Ian, are some of those included in here as line items so that you could consider what the what the um, order of magnitude to either include it or exclude it might be. Yeah. Um, the other- That's right. Yep, yeah, and the process here is very normal in, <laughs> in the design. The design professionals are the ones that know the scope best. Um, they're the ones that know that, okay, we might have a finish that's full height in one space, but you know, to go to a Wayne Scott height could save us X amount. Uh, maybe it's not, 
the, you know, maybe that's something that the group would consider. So they're the ones that know their scope best. So when I said that all of the professionals were in the room reconciling, those are the ones that put the design documents together and know the scope. So they're the ones that are saying, hey, you know, a consideration might be to reduce something by X amount or to have this material instead of that material or you. So um, that's often how this process works in order to put forward suggestions. The, and to Lorraine's point, they're not always the ones that everyone, you know, I don't, I've never seen a VE log take everything on it, <laughs> a plus or a minus. Um, so just so everyone knows, these are the design professionals um, recommendations to get us on budget. No, not, not all recommendations. Not, oh, sorry. Um, options for ideas discussion. Ideas to put forward, options to consider. Yes. <laughs> right, yes. Thank you, Lorraine. Also, um, does, Lorraine, that answer uh, your, does that answer your question, Court? Yeah, so just as a matter of process, we understand these have been generated by the paid professionals among us, and uh, they are not to be considered recommendations, but rather possibles. Um, and it's a first cut, as Ian says, so the list doesn't necessarily uh, stop here. Um, as a matter of process, we don't have a uh, recommitment today toward 100 million that says, let's look at this for today's possibilities. I haven't heard that yet. So. I think this walkthrough, Dawn, is simply to understand them without a context around a particular goal uh, whereby we might start uh, uh, hitting any of these. Would that be correct? That's correct. And the idea was that all of this information would be presented today. And next week's meeting is either further discussion, further information if needed. And we would, at, I believe the intent of next week's meeting is to vote something forward to put in front of the town. So the idea was that let's share the information, let's have conversation about it, let's talk about it, let's give some time in between, you know, needing to make a decision about it and then have next week's meeting uh, follow up and then hopefully, um, you know, come to a consensus, take a vote to um, put something forward to the town. Yeah, okay. Um, more context on this because we've got a, a delta of uh, something less than $3 million here according to today's estimates. Mm -hmm. um, and when I look at the uh, cost estimate uh, pre-pandemic, it was 555 or, or 559, we heard both. So today we're looking at a increase of uh, something less than 3%. Um, which many of us would say is not what we're seeing elsewhere in the industry. So uh, I'm going to ask at some point that uh, Peter and Ian really, really uh, help us understand the, uh, the escalation that seems to be uh, quite, quite minor uh, in a, in a industry uh, that's pretty volatile right now. So I know we're looking at uh, VE right now, but I hope we can come back to that escalation number and see how ours fits with industry trends. Well, could we stick with the VE list for now? No, that's what I'm suggesting. I'm just saying, I, I think at some point we have to return to, to that and see that that uh, is examined a little more carefully. Also, uh, I just wanted to, to note, this is Peter again, I'd just like to note that this is a list that isn't just, let's cut this, cut this, cut this, cut this. There's uh, several items in here that came up during the uh, reconciliation that have to do with site and et cetera that isn't, isn't affecting the building at all. And there's others in here that are uh, items that have an additional cost. So it's kind of an all encompassing sort of uh, list. This is Charlie. I, I think it would be good as a matter of process to make sure that we, we've got the right numbers here and that we understand what's in some of these numbers. I, I, you know, for example, under the mechanical, I had a couple of questions on a couple of the items, not gonna pass judgment on whether they should be in or out, just wanna make sure I understand them. Yep. I think that's yeah, we'll the goal is to one go, one here. Yeah, go through the list so people understand what it includes. Yep, yep, so we'll, we'll get started. We got 30, 31 items essentially on this log uh, for consideration. So the way that we organize this is we have the, the site items first. We wanted to talk about that up front. We've got um, 
MEP in green, who've got interiors in blue, exteriors in gray, and then architecture down below. So uh, we wanted to start with site, with the site discussion, because, um, you know, this is probably the, mo the, the, the biggest savings that you could have on the job is in the site work package. And so for, for every job you, you know, you dig a, you dig a found a basement and foundation and you, you generate a, a, a lot of uh, soil that needs to be dealt with. Uh, you strip topsoil off the site. Uh, you, you have other excavations that need to happen for, for different features, utilities and other site foundations and that sort of thing. So you're, you're generating a lot of uh, soil that uh, either needs to be taken to a disposal facility somewhere and you have to pay for uh, that, uh, that cost, uh, both the trucking and the disposal fees, which is very costly. Um, and that's what we had included in the base scope um, is to dispose of all the soil and then bring uh, new, new materials back to the job site um, and bring in, you know, suitable materials and new topsoil and that sort of thing for, for the new construction. Um, and so what we were thinking about up front here is, you know, how, how can we reuse, how much can we reuse in relation to topsoil? How much can we reuse in relation to suitable fill material on site? And, um, you know, can we use it on our site? Can we use it elsewhere in town, uh, other projects, uh, that, that sort of thing. So, um, when we're talking about options one and two here, this is kind of the, the, the big soil disposal discussion. Um, and we made some assumptions, you know, working with the, with the civil engineer, geotech engineers, uh, to determine what, what are good assumptions to make here for, um, how much we can reuse. So what this log can is I going just, before is, you go to that can i just give a little bit more context yeah. as to why it's yeah, not sure. in the base sure so we have yep. two phases of construction phase one is build a new building phase two is then tear down the old building and finish the fields we have very limited on-site space for building the new building lay down construction so there were not apparently there were not evidently um a lot of opportunities to stockpile i mean there's a lot of material as you know as a committee we have four borings through schematic design. So our material information is limited, but also the site is limited where we can actually stockpile. Um, once we got the original estimates from the estimators and saw just the dollar values of this item, it seemed a no brainer, frankly, as something to do, but we need to find space for that on site. And, and working with many communities, we know communities don't like to dispose of soil or have just site materials dispose that they will find other uses for them. So I started working with the town manager to see if there are other locations in site that we can A, bring it to, stockpile it, stabilize it, and bring it back when we need it because there's a difference of how much we need in phase one versus phase two. Or when there's excess left over, is there somewhere in, in town that would be willing to take that? So we're only paying the cost to truck it to that location instead of paying the cost of disposing it. Um, so we're, we're being somewhat conservative, I will say, on the 50%, but until we have more data, we cannot go stronger on that number. So we're very comfortable. We've worked with our geotech and our civil engineer and our landscape architect on the volumes, and we're very comfortable with those proposals. But those are, um, there's a reason that's not in the base right now. So we would need to work closely with the school as well as with the town for where on site we could potentially stockpile because it would be for phase one, it's not gonna be within the construction zone. It's actually gonna be within the school zone, the area that the school is using that we would need to create the stockpiles because that lay down area is so limited. So sorry about that, Ian, I, did, yep. I just wanna give some background. Oh no, that's great. No, that's good. Um, so, so what we came up with uh, as far as detail here is items one and two, and there's an A and a B. So item one is the topsoil. So this is assuming that 50% of the topsoil can, can uh, be, be used, be reused. Um, and then uh, dispose of the, all, the, all the excess material in, on, on other sites in, in town. So uh, one is to take the topsoil offsite 
um, and to stockpile it. So that's option A. And to take it off-site, stockpile it, and then bring it back to the site and reuse it. Option B is to find a find a home for it on-site. So stockpile it on-site and um, and uh, leave it, and then bring it back and put it in place where you where you need to put it in its in its finished condition. So. Uh, the big difference between those two numbers is going to be your trucking costs. So you're not trucking it off site. You're just trucking it. Uh, you're just moving it around the site essentially. So that's why there's a bigger savings for leaving it on site versus taking it off site. Um, two A and B talks about suitable fill material. So th these are, these are other soils, not top soil, but, but materials that you can reuse on site material that doesn't have organics or other deleterious materials in them that that um that are good for uh suitable for compaction and and uh whatnot and can be reused on site so uh a assumes again that you would take these soils off site and stockpile them and then bring them back to reuse b assumes that you would uh find a home for them on site for a stockpile and then put them into place um, and then lo lose the rest of the material um, at other sites uh, in town. I, I so, would like us to also consider uh, when we consider the option of offsite versus onsite, the sustainability impacts, the road and you know infrastructure impacts, and the impacts in the neighborhood of uh, potentially not having to you know take this stuff elsewhere. Um, so if there's any way to do it on site, we should try to move heaven and earth, not to move heaven and earth to other places. Yep. Um, so if we want to take a pause, we can actually look at the, the, um, on-site locations. You want to do that, Lorraine? I've got, I've got them in the presentation here. Lorraine, you're muted. Sorry, right, thank you. Um, so I was just going to say, I'm not going to spend a lot of time because in order to get through the VE list, I think we need to go through them and give you an understanding. But this is a diagram our architect, uh, Mike Gowhan, put together. There's a lot of caveats that go with this that um, were in the email associated with it. But you can see potential stockpile areas. We obviously, to the top of the page, that's right adjacent to the septic system. And we'd have to look at access to get in there. We'd also have to coordinate because school would be um, in session when we start doing this. So that's something that we need to factor because we'd be taking those soils off right away. Um, so this, this got generated as a result of seeing the soil numbers. So we have not had an opportunity to speak to Laurie or Jason about this. Um, so this is very premature, but um, we just wanted to start looking at where we, where we could and how much we could accommodate. Um, because we agree with you, Matt, that if we can keep it on site, it's the best solution for everybody. It saves the most amount of money as well um, and avoids all those trucking costs. There's just other operational issues that we need to factor in with drop off, pick up, parking um, and set the current septic system. So we have a little bit of work to do, but this is something that we're going to be working on next week. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that just a comment, the, the red is um, less impactful to the school operations. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the blue encompasses parking area um, and just a bigger, bigger location on, on the north, northeast side of the school there. So um, what's the area down below that's off screen? That's the, the field. Right? That's, that's the lower field, but then we have to oh, figure out how to sorry, get it down it. there. Yep. Yep. So this would be an area down on the, on the lower fields. So there are, there are impacts, obviously, because it would take a field out of consideration. So as I said, Matt, we haven't had the chance to meet with Laurie and Jason on this. Um, we produced this as a result of seeing the dollar values. Um, Is there more or less cut than fill? There's more cut, I believe. So you know that there is the desire to create some kind of path up from the rail trail. And I yeah, just wonder if some of this field, fill could you know, help that, with that. Uh, not that that's in the scope of the project, but gosh, it might start getting us in that direction. We could leave it there for someone to do it later. 
that that Please needs to be an ADA feet. compliant <laughs> ramp. So that that's a big deal. All right. I think yeah, we, so just to keep it at a high level. We have a lot of fill. <laughs> we have a lot of fill. Yep. Whatever. Yep. Yep. So that's high level. Um, item number three is another site item here. So this is reducing the outdoor classrooms from four to three. Um, so that has a value of $33,000. Um, number four is replacing the Gabian seating wall. And I mean, wouldn't that impact here. the educational plan? Yes. Okay. Because I yes. thought we were, you know, the educational plan was our target. So. Yep, that is impacting. Uh, yeah, and it, 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 I, we hid the details here, but we have columns that say educational implant, uh, impact the educational plan, yes or no. So that is an impact on that one. Um, <clears throat> this is switching the Gabion wall seating to um, concrete. So savings of 73 grand there. Um, and again, and sorry, anything in parentheses is a, is a deduct, so it's a savings, anything um that doesn't have parentheses in it is an ad uh so this is getting into mechanical so this is adding uh the displacement ventilation system uh in the audit auditorium that's both both the hvac and the architectural components um so that's two hundred thirty thousand dollars ad um and again this is something that we didn't include in the base but uh, i think that the the sustainability subcommittee was making a recommendation to to uh proceed with that. So uh, this is how we framed it up uh, so that you had that menu option. Um, add all one, this is for the enhanced ventilation um, in the school. So this is a 30% increase in uh, performance and changing the manufacturer to AirQuity, which is kind of a more uh, sophisticated uh, system. So that's uh, close to a $1.2 million ad uh, for that. That's a big item. So these are, the, these are basically the two, the two ad items here associated with, with ventilation. Ian, on that, uh, on that item number six, um, I'm wondering yep. whether it would be good to break out air acuity separately. And uh, also, I, I think we discussed 25% CFM uh, as opposed to 30. I don't know what, what number for CFM you have in here, but I think the agreement was that we were going to continue to look at, at a sort of a, a compromise position between the, the low that, that the architects had suggested and the high. This is the, I believe this is the high number. Yeah, um, I think this went out, when, when it went out for estimating, it had the 30 because that was the original number and the the reduction to 25 came during estimating, so I'm not sure we changed that, to be fair. Yeah, that, that, I, I assume, that, and that's okay. I, I think that's perfectly okay. You didn't have all the info when it went out, but I, 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 I don't think we want to make that nut uh, as large as it is uh, because it probably wouldn't come out that way if we went with a more compromised position. I can see what we can do to break those into two and reduce that to the 25 CFM. Yeah, Thank you. I, yeah, we did. We did have that thought of breaking out air acuity because um, we kind of combined the two there, the increase and air acuity. So um, we'll, we'll try to break that out. Um, I, my my understanding um, of this ventilation is that we were talking of somewhere between thirty and sixty percent increase for these values. So this is this is the lower end of it. So I think that twenty five. CFM and correct me if I'm wrong would be uh, above this between 30 and 60 percent. I, I need to get so, that confirmed from Andy, so I'll get that confirmation. Yeah, I mean you also yeah, have to I, look at the air handling units in terms of their capacity because that was specified. If they drop the, the those air handlers uh, down to a, a lower number, that's going to save money. So there you go. Yep. Good. Uh, number seven is uh, just getting ready, rid of any uh, convenience power electrical for the outdoor classrooms. Uh, you know, small savings there, close to 10 grand. Uh, removing bollard lighting for the outdoor classrooms is, uh, 
you know, $21,000 and change, um, deduct there, um, reducing advanced lighting controls in the building from 100% addressable lights to 60%, uh, could yield a $74,000, um, savings. Just one of the things on that. Anything. Yeah, one of the things on that, Ian, because you can't see the comments, is this is actually, and this impacts meeting the stretch code. So this is not something that the design team is recommending because in order to meet the stretch code, we need to meet three options of the C406. And this is one of them. So if we take that away, we have to add something else. And we're already maxed out on some of the options. So this is not recommended because then we're gonna have impacts meeting the stretch code. Well, also, is the recommendation 85%? Pardon me? Is the recommendation 85%? No, it would take it to 60%. Going from 100 to 65, 60% is the, but we're not recommending this. That's what we're saying. Yeah, and wouldn't it increase operating costs? Um, it's all it, occupant behavior at that point, Matt. So a lot of schools do not have the 100%, but more of the schools that are going that zero are going 100% because you've got to meet that C406 requirement. I've seen the requirements there for a reason. It must reduce consumption. Because of that occupant behavior, right? And so it's automatic. It takes out the, the occupant yeah, behavior yeah. part of it. Yeah. Right. That's, but that's we, the idea. we need this yeah. for code, so. Uh, number, number 10 here is switching out the diesel, uh, sorry, switching out the natural gas generator with a diesel generator. So savings $117,000 there. Number 11 is uh, removing sinks in the nine team common areas. Uh, so that would be educational impact. That's 52,000 there. Removing the fire we had six in the team comments. Um, yeah. Is there any possibility for team comments to share six? I see that some of them are adjacent. These are really project-based learning spaces. So, I mean, it's all about occupancy of the building and how you're going to use that space to allow student agency. So I, we can talk offline with Laurie and Jace, uh, Justin about that. It, Lorraine, did the, adjacent classroom, did the adjacent classrooms have sinks? Let me just check that. Well, the science room should. They, yeah, they definitely will, yeah. But, but if you're out working in the team commons, you're not gonna go into a science classroom to use the sink. That's not appropriate. Why would that, why is that inappropriate? I don't understand. If you're holding a class, if there's a class going on in there at the time, you're not going to interrupt the class, right? Well, that's true. We don't interrupt classes with other classes. Right. Well, it would be interesting to know how, how that affects the ed plan. The general you classrooms do not have sinks. Yeah, that would, I was going to say if they do, in theory, those students belong in a classroom. They're like breaking out of a classroom. If the classrooms had sinks, I'd feel differently than the fact that they don't. There really should be sinks somewhere for project-based learning, but that's something we should get Justin and others to potentially weigh in on. Um, yeah. Yep. Number 12 is removing the, the fire pump. And, and this is something that uh, we wouldn't be able to do until we have a, um, a flow test. Uh, so we, this, this is not feasible during this, this uh, phase, but we wanted to put it on here for, for a future savings measure. Uh, so that would yield around 137,000. Uh, and this gets you into the interiors. So interiors, we've got uh, removing millwork stations from grade level six team commons, keep the sink on the perimeter of the room. That would save you 37,000. Um, we had a, a, an item here for just changing ceiling materials uh, in various spaces. So taking some of the wood look metal ceiling panels and replacing them with uh, the two by two acoustical tiles, uh, around 7,500 square feet of that could save you $344,000. So 
So that's a pretty big item there. Um, it's just going to change the look and the, the feel of the spaces. Um, reduce quantity of wall tile in the cafeteria to 50%. So just um, less tile in the cafeteria could save you 12 grand. Um, removing the wood paneling from the media center walls and ceiling and just replacing it with painted walls and ceiling could yield a savings of $52,000. Um, we have two options here for the interior light shelf. So one is to, to reduce it down to 10 inches uh, width, which would save you 17 grand. Um, to remove it completely, which would impact daylighting, would be uh, 52 grand savings there. And then on the exteriors, we've got a number of items here. We've got kind of two items on uh, brick options for uh, south elevation, switching that out with 4x4x16 four by four by ground face CMU could yield a savings of 78 grand on the south elevation. So that's the elevation facing the woods. Uh, replace brick type three dark with four by four by 16 ground face CMU in all locations uh, around the perimeter. So that's 49 grand. Um, I, you can't, you have to choose one or the other here on, on this. You can't choose both uh, of those menu options. Replacing all brick type one, uh, which is the lighter brick with ground face CMU would yield a savings of 43 grand. Um, so those are some brick changes on the exterior. Uh, the next one, a couple of ones here are related to sun shades. So this is scaling back some of the sun shade options um, from south facing windows, the classrooms, just eliminating them would be 143,000. Yeah, you, you got a question, Chris. I'm wondering if um, we might be able to move this along or maybe revisit this just because in the interest of time this morning and also with a longer term goal of there's a lot of information to digest, understand, ask questions about. So for the longer term, I'm wondering if it's even realistic for us to think of next Friday, a week from now or next Thursday to come up with a consensus on these issues along with others. but. Uh, that's something for the committee to think about. So that's just my suggestion now because it is now what, 840. Thanks. Yeah, and it just strikes me that in what, looking at this list, there's ample opportunity for us to hit a number and that we could instead, you know, agree on a number and then tune the list to reach it. Um, it just seems like, you know, there, I agree with Chris. I, I'm not in any position to make any decisions on these now. I would defer on many of them, but I just think we the the good news here is there's a lot of stuff, and there are and, and the, they do add up to a significant amount of money. And given the estimates uh, being only a modest amount above our existing budget, you know, it seems like we're in the realm here of being able to you know, come up with a number that we could bring before town meeting um, and then, uh, you know, work on refining the details as we go. I wonder if I could pick up on that. Um, I, I, I certainly agree. I think that as to this list, absent uh, a goal around it, uh, one, we could simply ask if people have questions on any particular items uh, because we we do have this we can actually see it more clearly uh, on our own documents that were sent to us um, and the purpose of looking at this absent any goal would simply to be uh, to ask ask the question absent any budget target uh, do any of these deserve consideration and then we can come back to it and look at them again with any budget uh, uh, target that this committee might determine. I'd love to see the detail from the professionals about does this impact uh, you know, the, the operational cost? Does this impact longevity? Does this impact the educational plan? Um, you know, and then I think with that broader context, be able to understand 
you know, okay, yeah, this this is there, or we want the midpoint of this one versus the more aggressive option, and so on, to come up with a you know a credible plan. Yeah, I, I think you guys are on the right track here. Um, you know, you're you're in a really good position to 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 determine what what number you want to reach and and achieve it. So that that's what we. That's what we were trying to do here is to set you guys up for success um, and, and have a plan to do that. So I do appreciate this is a very extensive VE list and it does add up. And, and perhaps in time, Ian, you could tell us uh, wh which of these really deserve consideration irrespective of a budget target. And then the second go would be with budget target uh, in mind. Wouldn't it seem that it's really just the excavation, right? That the others are all, there are reasons this was in the scope to begin with. We didn't just throw it in for the heck of it. Yeah, I, I think this suggests we're almost to the bottom of this list. If you could just take us through to the end of it. I think, you know, it's, it's worthwhile for everybody to truly walk through this, but quickly. Um, we're almost at the end of the list. I'll try to speed it up here. So th these are these are sunshade options. Uh, number 25 is acoustical metal screen. So this is the screening that goes around the equipment that's on the roof. Um, so right now it's kind of uh, on all sides of the equipment, boxing it in. This is both for, for visual and for acoustical, uh, you know, blocking sound from from the equipment. So if you reduce that, if you selectively reduce that, um, you know, you might have, you might be able to see it visually. It could release more sound, but, um, you know, they, they think that we could reduce it by 164 linear feet, which would yield a pretty significant savings. Uh, you know, your closest neighbors are to the south. So that would be consideration to keep, keep noise away from that, that neighborhood to the south. Um, removing 934 uh, gross square feet from the building. Uh, this one would be related to uh, this area at the gym here. So this would eliminate the hallway and shift the locker room storage rooms um, tighter against the gymnasium. So you can lose this space here um, and it would look something like this in the end. And that is a $188,000 savings right there. Uh, this item 27 would reduce the, the length of the canopy. Uh, the big canopy that, that juts out towards the parking lot would would take, you know, chop 15 feet off of that. You could save uh, 45 grand there. And then this is just kind of glass connectors and curtain wall changes, um, shifting it uh, to, to different uh, materials here could yield some savings, uh, 56 and 48. Uh, this is a big item. This this would change. Uh, this has a, a sustainability impact here. So you'd be changing your curtain wall from a triple glaze to a double glaze system. It's a big item, um, but again, it would would impact uh, sustainability. Five hundred four thousand dollars. Yeah. EUI. EUI. Yep. Yeah, significant. Uh, and then these are just some uh, some changes in in uh, materials. So instead of having CMU in the receiving area, you would go to an FRP panel with impact resistant sheet rock. You save $100,000 there, 106,000 uh, there. And then same thing in the gym, switching CMU to impact resistant sheet rock, you could save $134,000 uh, in the gym space. So again, 3.8 is, is your maximum potential savings here. Um, that, that includes the uh, auditorium displacement ventilation. So that, that says we're going to, we're going to proceed with the recommendation. We're going to include that. Uh, but it doesn't include the enhanced ventilation. So, but it does include changing the windows from double to tripled, which is, is or triple to double, which is a big, it, it, yeah, it, it does, which is, yeah. you know, you're, you, you're going to lose probably your not, five. probably not, probably not somewhere you want to go, but it's, right. it's a factor. So, Great. So that's the overview of the 
value engineering log for anyone that is going to look further at it, digest it, come up with questions, et cetera. So I think it's good to, to get through that in full transparency. These were the um, design professionals, you know, uh, ideas about where money could be saved short of calling them a recommendation because obviously some of these have major impacts. So um, does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, I'd like to move the conversation to um, talking about the budget number and coming to some sort of, you know, getting questions answered, looking deeper at some of that, the bigger picture. But I don't want to sell this short. If there are specific questions you need answered, obviously, after today, if you have further questions or uh, additional questions or think of something, um, feel free to email uh, the chairs and we will send it through to the design professionals for them to um, get answers for the committee. But I, and Stephen, I have a question. Sure, Stephen. Uh, for Lorraine and Ian, um, is there a time at which these items, like as we get into design development, is there a time at which these items cease to be available to us uh, as VE options um, or um, do, does this, like if we decide to do nothing, hypothetically speaking, um, are these, because my guess is down the line with the volatility of the market that court referenced, there's probably going to be an, a time where we're going to have to do VE again, mm -hmm. potentially, especially as you get into the project. And does this list kind of carry forward that way? So if we, um, you know, almost looking at it as kind of a part of a contingency. So I would say that um, we are always looking for opportunities for value management. And we like to call it value management instead of value engineering because some things are an ad and some things are a deduct. Um, so we're always paying to that, paying attention to that as designers as we continue to evolve the design. So I think if there's just things that, you know, it would be good for us to discuss, this is an educational impact. This is not something we need to, we want to do. It comes off the list. So we look for other opportunities. Similar with the, you know, triple glaze windows to double, that's a significant EUI impact that has to either go in or come out. And I don't think that comes back in the future. I think that there are items there that could be reviewed again and be brought back on the list. You know, the acoustical screen, you know, once we get in and get our environmental noise assessment done, that whole thing might go away. Once we get our hydrant flow test, that whole thing might go away. So I think there are still opportunities, but what I would urge and what I would strongly recommend is we have to make a decision for SD. So whether it's in or out, and then, you know, there, I think there should be items that say, this is not something we're going to revisit, but this is something we could revisit. Does that I would answer agree. your question, Stephen? uh sort of um yeah sort of and i guess i guess i'd say as we get into the, the discussion of the budget i just i just want to share my opinion that i think um the reconciled cost estimate that was presented today is one of the best days we've had on this project in a while i think that that is extraordinarily good news considering all the things we've been fearing and hearing um about the marketplace and so i uh i feel like you know, this is a good day for the project, even if even if we have further to go on the budget, um, I still feel like, wow, this is this is way better than I thought it was going to be. So um, I guess congratulations. Lorraine, Lorraine, I would I would add um, that um, you need you, you said it in a nice way, but you need direction. So as we go forward with this list and add to it, subtract from it. There has to be a, a line drawn that says, this is what we're proceeding with. That doesn't, and so you can get, get going and coordinating all these together. That doesn't mean as we get further on down the road, we can't reintroduce some stuff or put in some new stuff. Sure. Yep. And just as a reminder, we get these same type of estimates reconciled independent cost estimates at the end of design development. I don't have the schedule in front of me. I can't tell you when that is. I'm going to guess next summer, end of summer, Lorraine. I'm just going. Oh, okay. you're talking. Yeah, if you start SD February, maybe it's like six months or something. Um, yeah. And then 60%, so end of DD, which is design development, the next phase, if this does in fact move forward for the town. Um, and then 60% schema, yeah. uh, construction documents and then 90% construction documents. So we see these same type of reconciled estimates three more times in the process to give us a check all along the way. So yeah. So the DD estimate will be sometime May, late May of 2022. 
we complete 60% the end of October. So back up about a month before that. And then we complete 90% in January. So just before Christmas. Yeah. So basically in the next year, <laughs> just over 13 months, we're going to see three more of these. So there's going to be plenty of um, checking and balancing along the way. So I don't want to lose sight of that as we're asking questions about like how to decision make. Did you have, Frank, were you saying something? No. Okay. And Pat, I see your hand up. Yeah. yeah. I am. Um, there are a couple of things. I think a big number in here is the, um, the soil and mm -hmm. removing it or not removing it and where we can store it. And I wondered, um, Stephen, if you have any idea when we ha would, might have more um, understanding of the probability of being able to use it elsewhere in town or store it elsewhere in town, because that just seems like a low hanging fruit that if we, we could you know, understand that, uh, it would take us a, a long way. The, the other thing I wanna say is um, there's also things in here that I would really like to have the sustainability committee weigh in on as um, things that we don't really want to touch. Um, and I, I think we need to understand those things. Um, and again, I, I consider that low hanging fruit. What are things we don't want to touch? I, I didn't see a lot of programmatic disturbance in this list. Um, but if there are any programmatic issues that we don't want to touch, I think we should know that. Um, and I really think we need to know all of those things before we come up with a budget number. Um, so I would be very hesitant to think about coming up with a budget number before we have more information. So Stephen, I'm going to let you answer the question about dirt. Dirt, yeah. Um, so it, um, this was um, brought up earlier this week. And so right away, I, um, you know, kind of sent the details on the quantities to, um, you know, town departments, CPW, CMLP, um, DPLM. And so we are actively working on identifying sites, town owned sites, as well as potentially private sites that we could approach. Um, you know, I think there's, and I think to Matt's point, one of the things that we're looking at is it would be great to have, um, you know, proximity to this site uh, as kind of a threshold matter because we it's a lot of trucks. Uh, and so we want to minimize that. But at the same time, there's a lot of variables that we'll have to balance. If there's a site nearby that maybe, you know, needs to be cleared a little bit to accommodate that, is that what's the trade off of doing the clearing versus the trucking distances? And so it's not as simple a question as, you know, where do we have a giant open space where we can dump 40,000 cubic yards of soil and store it? <clears throat> but uh, it may end up being a multi-site solution. So uh, that's a long way of saying we do have some specific thoughts, but nothing nailed down yet. And also to that end, Pat, you know, I haven't had an opportunity to meet with Justin and Lori um, with the diagram that Mike developed. So you know, the on-site potential stockpiles and what the impacts are to uh, the day-to-day -day school operations. So we can take that on early next week and try and, you know, resolve that. And, and if we can identify, you know, the, what we need to stay on site and then provide a, a refined smaller number for excess that needs to be disposed of, that might make Stephen's life easier because he's looking for something smaller. Lorraine, May I ask or suggest make a suggestion actually on the VE log? Can you have columns for educational impact, sustainability impact, um, maintenance impact? Like as, as a yes or a no? Like does this affect it or you know just to give folks a sort of a, a bucket of the impact on whatever it is? I don't know. Do There's have, probably we do have educational and sustainable on the PDF. Okay. You can just hit it so that we can see on the screen, but on the PDF that was sent Got out. It. I don't even remember yes. seeing that. Okay. So that is indicated. We may want to add maintenance because some of this could be maintenance, like the CMU to FRP. So for those that don't know what an FRP is, it's just a fiber re reinforced panel. That's often like protect wall protection, basically, that you run into it with, you know, a machine or a pallet jack or something. It, it can withstand a little bit of um, uh, dirt, you know, it, it's durable. So just Lorraine, also, I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry, uh, one more. Lorraine, we might want to add also uh, something about the quality of space because I'm worried that uh, there's no advocacy in the um, in the columns for that. And we could wind up with a well-maintained building, uh, environmental building, um, a well-maintained, um, you know, a good environmental condition, but uh, absent any sort of quality of space, we might regret making some decisions. So, um, some stuff. Hey, that... Carmen, how's it going? This is Chris Carmody. It's about nine o'clock on Friday, yes. November fifth. Uh, I just you're not on mute. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, Carl. <Tom>. So, um... <laughs> So yeah, and so I, I I I worry about that column or subject matter of things mm -hmm. that might generate a school that none of us would want to be in. Um, That's a good point, Saul. I'm thinking and, about uh, the the shading as an example of that. Is that something? Is that where you're headed with this? Ab like absolutely that? shading. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a That's serious a thing. Point. It's a, it's a shading. Um, but I mean, a shading is kind of an interesting conversation, right? Because right now, suddenly, um sunlight has become a problem but also views outdoors are very important so um you know if we for instance mess around with a curtain wall and suddenly kids are in a big lobby space and big uh, entrance lobby space and they can't see outdoors that's a problem right mm -hmm. um and you know certain things like you know the ceiling tiles i mean i think everybody wants a level of warmth in the institution right um we have very little finishes right now in the project probably one of the sort of simpler configurations in terms of finish schedule um but you know so the rest when we start taking the rest of it right then we might be left with a school that's functioning well but none of the kids would enjoy being there. so i want to make sure that that column is there we can we can definitely add that column so and it'll be you know it'll be our perspective on it but um just sure. as your designer no, no, absolutely, absolutely. Be that recommendation I mean, some, thing, some things can be taken easily and some things are a little bit more difficult yeah. And for those in the room that don't know Saul, he is one of our design consultants. He's the designer with Lorraine's team. He's with you and Cole, their partners, SMMA's partners. So I'm just realizing I know who Saul is, but maybe others um, who are with us today may not. So thank you for saying that, Saul. Okay, anything else related to the value management log? I see Matt Root's hand up. Oh, hey, Matt. Don, thank you. Well, Pat, I just wanted to follow up. Did I hear a request for the sustainability subcommittee to meet and make a recommendation for next Friday? Is that a next step? That that seems to me that that would be appropriate um, for you to look at, you know, especially things like triple pane windows and um, uh, some of the items that are on this list. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly we can try logistically next thursday is a holiday yeah. we've got a post for with 48 hours so i think that leaves wednesday for the subcommittee to meet so i don't know lorraine i mean we can take the the, the discussion offline but we'll see if we can pull something together on wednesday oh well, i could make myself available on that wednesday morning and i just need to get martine and andy <laughs> all right thank you lorraine yeah same we're available Okay, should we talk about cost questions? Um, Court had asked Don, about uh, escalation. Um, Don, you want, want me to take a shot at Court's um, limit regarding uh, escalation? Regarding the escalation? Um, sure, and I'd invite Lorraine to, to you know, follow up as well if she right. has any insight you guys were all part of the sounds like extensive conversation with the estimators um about this topic so feel free to to share what you guys talked about what you learned from the estimators and what the um you know recommendation for this is so, so sure, Peter. okay so lorraine and, and ian i'll kind of um kind of set the context of it and then you guys can can add in um we're we, Hill, in SMMA, uh, were concerned about the, the overall estimate. So part of estimating this back two years ago and this July and August and then into November is trying to anticipate where we're going to be, whatever that is, 14, 15 months from now when we bid it. So 
putting aside what we've carried so far for escalation, I would say that one of our main concerns uh, between where we were back in July for cost and where we are now for anticipated costs was square footage. So um, we, we feel, at least Hill feels, that the amount of square footage that ultimately became this building um, was amazingly close to the fact, the way we figured it in as a factoring um, to come up with the square footage of space multiplied by 1.5 is all we were doing before. We were really concerned that we kept within that. And uh, the, the differential in the square footage that was taken off by about four different people was, um, was very, 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 very close. And we're talking about nuancing about how thick the brick is around the exterior of the building. So uh, in the general picture, that was one of the main things we were concerned about. It wouldn't lead to additional money. On the percentages, um, just if I'm looking at it really, really roughly, and Oren can correct me, in July, August, we were, I believe, $79.9 million. <clears throat> now we're $82.5 million. I think these are the numbers that Court was alluding to. That difference of, of about 3% really doesn't pertain to escalation. It pertains to we finally had a set of documents that we were able to bid. The, the $82 million includes a little less design capacity. It includes some things that may not have been picked up before. Um, it really is a number that now is something is a, as a starting point that we can move forward. So the fact that it's up a little bit, that particular amount doesn't really have to do with escalation. In right now, in the in the bid, uh, sorry, in the estimate, we had we had seen and anticipated during 2021 that there was, and again, there's a lot of there's a lot of faces up on the screen that I'm seeing now. We all can have our own opinion because we're all looking at our own personal lives and should we sell our house now and what our investment should be. So everybody has an opinion here, but we've been seeing about a percent a month during 2021, arguably, okay? Um, so right now, what we've done, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, <laughs> Rain, is we have estimated the job as if it's going out to bid today, which took into account the first 10 months of, of 2021's escalation. So that's built into the estimate. So that shows a little bit of good news in that if we hadn't had this kind of severe increase in construction costs during 2021, my opinion would be that we would not be at 82.5, we'd be closer to the, to the 79. So that's built into the number. Then moving forward, um, we have carried one factor, and Ian, is it 5.25? Is that the number we've been carrying for us? Yep. So yep. from now going forward to bid period, which is what, 13, 14 months from now? About you more, guys more. Yeah, yeah. we can go to bid so, in uh, uh, April, March. March. Okay. Yeah. March. So then I'll turn it. So I'll turn it over now to Lorraine and Ian, and they can tell you what we've carried, considering the fact that we're going to be bidding the job uh, a little over a year from now. So I'm done. So we spent a significant amount of time talking about the unit cost of all the materials. Just so you understand, the reconciliation meeting was a nine hour day. Um, we, I, SMMA sets up a blue beam session with the two estimates. Our entire team see all the comments. We share them with the estimators live. The estimators bring in their specialists. So they brought in their, their site guys, their MEP guys. We talked about the unit dot value of, you know, how much per CFM, which has changed how much for steel per tonnage. There's a big discrepancy uh, between the two estimators when we started off on steel assumptions and how much tonnage assumptions, our structural engineer clarified that. Um, and then, you know, wood, anything, any wood product. Um, so wood went through the roof. We all know that from everyone doing their home renovations in 2020, but it's actually back to pre 2018 prices, uh, at least for the commercial industry. So, you know, what we had been factoring for wood, we were all comfortable with those numbers and they didn't see as much escalation. So there's a balance that happens in the unit prices as they're applying the costs based on the SD documents. Some items went up, some items went down from what we had looked at in feasibility. 
And remember the feasibility estimate is really a cost per square foot estimate. So now they have the detail, they have the drawings, they have the site drawings and architecturals, they have a full set of specifications to go off. Um, so we, we spent a lot of time with every single discipline talking about the unit price of that particular item under their scope. And then also spent a lot of time talking about how much was now within the estimate and how much is escalation and what do we think it, it's going from here. I think most people thought that, you know, by now we would have seen some changes and some um, softening of the, the steel market, but it's still a um, availability issue. It's still a transportation issue that we're seeing. So those numbers, those costs per square foot or those costs per ton actually stayed pretty high in this estimate. And that's, I think, where some of the overrun that we're seeing is coming in. But again, they're factoring them based on what we're paying for steel right now. And then the escalation is what will take us to the midpoint of construction. With a hard bid, those numbers are, are in the bid on day one. So the bidders have to make that assumption. Uh, CM at risk project, it's a little different, but with a hard bid, we're gonna get those numbers day one. So they, the bidders all have to factor that in. So they're gonna look at what they're gonna buy steel on the bid day. And they're going to factor how much is it going to cost to get the steel, you know, starting the shop drawings 30 days from award. So I think our both of our estimators were very confident in the three and a half percent. They have jobs coming in that are, to be honest, they're all over the place. Some are up, some are down, some are coming in under budget, some are coming in over budget. Um, they see every bid, um, both Peters, as we've said before, uh, Pete Timothy from AM Fogarty and Pete Bradley from PMNC. They do the bulk of the K-12 public um, estimating for Massachusetts. Um, Dawn has them on the project, on many of her projects. And every time the bids come in, they, we, as, as designers, we share them back with the estimators so they can see it. On the CM side, we share back the full open book so they get to see the real detail. On the design bid bid side, they just see the trade bidders and the GC price. But they're constantly evaluating what did I estimate that for and what is it coming in at and they're looking at that and they see a lot more bids than we do. Because they're working for most of the design K 12 design architects in Massachusetts. So they were very comfortable with the three and a half percent that is their profession. Um, I'm not going to challenge them on if they think that's right or wrong. Um, we were surprised with some of the unit prices in some of the items that had gone up quite a bit, um, but those are now in the estimate. So, and we did see some of the relief that we're seeing in the wood markets on some of the millwork costs. So that was nice to see that come down. I see some hands up. Yep. Um, before I go to the hands, Court, does that answer your question on escalation that you posed earlier that we're circling back to conversationally? Uh, well, it answers the question, but I, I will confess I'm, I'm not comfortable. Um, uh, I, I look at uh, numbers coming out of uh, ENR steel uh, projections and so on, and it, it worries me. But yes, it's an answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Root, I see your hand. Still up from before. <laughs> Chris. Uh, I think you're. Oh, there you oh, go. There we go. Uh, you're, you're thank good. you, Lorraine, for, for those details. That's very helpful. Um, I take it from all of that, you and Ian and, and Peter and certainly the estimators uh, looked at the recent MSBA reports and the numbers that MSBA is publishing. So those are factored into all of the stuff you're pre presenting, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, luckily, you know, Hill is more is the OPM on more than just the Concord project. We have more projects in design, so we share all the information we have, and and the MSBA is great at sharing you know, their information. So I know the estimators go in there. The estimators actually have more detail than the MSBA does in essence, because they have the bids and they have what they estimated. So I will say many times during the reconciliation meeting, I would pull up a bid from a project and say, okay, on this job, this is what it came in at three months ago. And Peter said, oh, I did that job. So he'll open his estimate and we'll check what the cost per square foot was. So much of the day was pulling real-time information um, so that we could compare, are we, you know, being conservative? Or are we not being conservative enough? You know, what is the market saying? So a lot of our time is, is not just saying what's in your project, but saying, okay, what's happening in the market and how are they, how are we in comparison to that? What is our metric? Did I answer your question, Chris? 
Okay, thank you. It's also worth noting that cost chart that's available to anyone um, has a range, um, the latest information, anywhere from $400 a square foot to $800 a square foot. So <laughs> all of those projects have unique uh, scopes and, and um, information that puts them in those extreme ranges, but there's a lot of projects in the 500 to 600 square foot range, a lot in the upper five. So we're right in that same spot. What were we, 570 something on this estimate? Lorraine, so um, if anyone yep. is interested, feel free to um, pull up that chart and take a look at what's out there. Any other questions from the committee? Not seeing any hands, not seeing anyone speak up. Sorry, um, oh, just, Matt Root. Hey, just quickly, Don. I, I, for the sub sustainability subcommittee, I just sent you a doodle poll. Please, uh, we need to get an agenda posted today. <laughs> no time like the present. <laughs> I would just make the agenda SC, SC recommendation on VE log to building committee. Possible vote. But we need a time. <laughs> yeah. Nope, I know on the time. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Thank, but I'm going to make that right now. Thank you, Lorraine. OK, anything else? I don't want to. I know there's a lot to absorb here, a lot of information, a lot of backup, a lot of detail. Um, that's why we didn't have any votes or any decisions to be made today. Um, we're going to let folks take all of this and digest it and come up with questions and or information that you need back. and. Um, we will continue this conversation next Friday, the 12th. If there's nothing, I'm trying to give people time to <laughs> feel free to raise your hands or ask questions. Otherwise, I am going to suggest that we take public comment now related to this and then move forward on the agenda if that is in fact the end of the discussion from the committee. Okay, so I will um, who do you, I see a couple of people on camera. Awesome. With hands up. I see Carrie Rankin on my screen first. So I'm going to call on you, Carrie. And I see a couple others in the queue. So thanks for your patience, everyone. Carrie, could you please say your name and your address and feel free to comment for the committee? Yeah, thank you. I'm um, Carrie Rankin. I'm from, uh, I live on 95 Upland Road. Uh, I have a two, a six, and an eight-year-old here in town, and we moved here about nine years ago, in large part because of the incredible educational programs from preschool, I see Pat Nelson on here, all the way through high school. Um, and I think I'm not alone, obviously, that the CMS is um, in need of a new building, and I'm beyond grateful for this um, committee for the incredible and tireless work that you, you put in to get us to this point. This was a very impressive presenta presentation. So thank you so much to everybody involved. Um, I just have one quick comment. Um, as we head into the next phase, um, I have no doubt that this committee will be thoughtful about finalizing the details in the structure um, and the budget. And I'm grateful for the incredible level of detail. I can't even believe all that I over <laughs> I heard today. So thank you for everything that's involved. Um, there's been some talk to keeping the building to $100 million. And this quote was impressively close to that figure. Um, and I've also heard talk of taking a scalpel to the plans if it exceeds $100 million. So um, my, my only hope is that we, as we approach all of this, it, that you all think about this from a long-term um, perspective and um, not make any cuts. Really, this, this is an incredible plan and um, I'm so grateful for all that's gone into it. And I hope that we'll bring it to the town as is um, without any, any cuts to be either the sustainability features or the academic pieces of it. So um, again, thank you. And I look forward to following along in the process. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie. Carmen Reese. Hello, Carmen. How are you? Good morning, everybody. Carmen morning. Reese, uh, 52 Devon Street, and I'm a uh, town moderator. Um, I just wanted to uh, draw the committee's attention to a couple of scheduling and process issues. The uh, special town meeting warrant has closed. Uh, there's only a single item on it, and it's this project. Uh, 
The warrant is scheduled to be mailed to households on November 22nd in order for it to arrive at households um, in plenty of time before uh, the hearing uh, that will be held. Um, in order to meet that mailing deadline, uh, Chris Carmody, who's, who's on and can answer questions about schedules, had planned to send the warrant to print on November 9th. Uh, that is before the committee's next meeting on the 12th. Um, I think we can ask Chris whether he would be able to hold that warrant um, to go to the printer on the 12th instead and still get it back in time. I understand there are supply chain issues there like everywhere else at the printer. Uh, and so they're gonna need more time than they typically would. Um, so that leads me to the question of what the number will be in the warrant. Right now, uh, the warrant language um, it has been recommended by bound, uh, bond council, and uh, I expect that the select board will take that up next Monday night and approve that language, but um, it has blank for the number. Uh, and I would strongly urge the committee and the select board not to send the warrant out without a number in it. It must have a number in it. And um, you can do one of two things if you haven't made your final decision about what the number is going to be. You can pick the number that the estimation has come back at uh, and put that in the warrant and it is always open uh, to move a warrant article for less than the number that is in the warrant. That's one option. The other option is to put in a lesser number for example, the target number of $100 million. And uh, as long as a motion is made within um, the general vicinity of the number that's in the warrant, it's within scope. And I would consider that if the number that was in the warrant was 100 million, but the committee ultimately decided to move the number at um, what is it, 103, I think, what, uh, the, the, um, uh, the estimated number, that that would be within scope. So you can do this either way, but I would strongly urge you to have a number in there. Um, and if you're not going to um, vote the number today, then I think um, we need to ask Chris whether he can hold the warrant article until uh, the 12th so that after your meeting on the 12th, uh, you can supply the number and he can send the warrant to the printer, um, but it, it can't go any longer than that to be sure. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Chris, can I put you on the spot? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so good morning. Um, and that's fine. We can hold it till November 12th. Um, as everyone's aware with, you know, the COVID economy and Chinese steel uh, paper for whatever reason is in whatever is, is um, our printers having a little bit of an issue with it. So um, as long as we can keep the warrant short, uh, it's right now it's at six pages. If we can kind of whittle it down a little bit, that'll give the printer a little bit more room to um, get it out to all, I think it's 7,200 households in Concord um, for mailing on uh, November 22nd. Okay. Uh, quick question for Carmen, if I may. Sure, part. And we can take this offline, Carmen, if necessary. I was uh, curious that the bond council suggested that the school committee would uh, manage expenditures, but in fact, we don't even receive the building until the town turns it over to the school. So I uh, just thought that was odd, but I, I don't know enough about this. So, um... I, I can't, that, that question um, is above my pay grade uh, court. And um, um, I, uh, I think it's worth asking bond council that question, um, but um, we just don't ever second guess bond council on the language of a warrant that article that has to be bonded, but we'll ask. I appreciate it, thank you. Carmen, can you just clarify um, for me, and maybe for other people who don't fully get this, 
the the warrant article is to expend the money. Then there's a motion that puts in the amount of money that we're asking the town to spend. So the warrant article will seek not only the expenditure of the funds, but the authority um, uh, uh, from the voters uh, from town meeting to um, uh, place bonds and any kind of borrowing. And so it's a two thirds vote, any kind of borrowing article requires uh, a two thirds vote. And then in addition here, uh, we will want to um, exclude the this uh, bonding from our um, uh, proposition two and a half uh, uh, calculation, and that is why it requires a vote at the polls um, afterwards for that um, exclusion. It's a debt exclusion vote. Um, so um, the motion is what town meeting acts uh, acts on uh, to uh, take legal action under the article that's in the warrant. And the article in the warrant is to give notice to the voters of what town meeting is going to take action on. So typically numbers are in there. I mean, there's a school of thought that it's enough to say the voters are gonna ask on whether to spend on, on, um, uh, on a middle school, a new middle school project without the number in it. Concord has never done it that way. We have always put the number in because that is always deemed to be part of notice to voters. Um, and then the motion can be the identical number or it can be pretty close because the idea is once you've given the voters notice of a particular number, you can wiggle a little bit from it. And that's why we always have the language in our uh, articles um, that says, um, or take any other action relative there, there too. It gives you a little bit of wiggle room on the motion. Um, so the motion would have to be pretty close. Um, and uh, rule of thumb has been 10 or 15%, but when you're talking about $100 million, I actually don't think 10 or 15% is reasonable. I would keep it a little tighter. So sorry for that long-winded answer, but I, I hope that um, clarifies it for you, Pat. Pat, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Good, that was great. Th thank you, Carmen. Um, and sounds like just to circle back, sounds like next Friday will be appropriately timed. And hopefully after our meeting, we have information that we can give Chris to send to the printer to move that um, notice forward to the town via mailings. So unless I hear otherwise, that will be the plan. Carmen, were you gonna say something? Yeah, Don, I think if you don't have a number by then, we won't have any choice but to send the warrant out with no number in it. And um, I, I think that is very far from ideal. Understood. And our plan is to have a number next week. Great, thank you for that. Hey, Don. Um, uh, yes, Stephen. So just before we move on, uh, on the question of um, who, you know, ultimately then oversees the project and, you know, gives, you know, I'll say expenditure control. I mean, ultimately it's a town project. I think <clears throat> typically, you know, the finance department would, you know, review uh, invoices and contracts and the town manager would sign the, those documents on a project like this. Uh, I think if the if this was an MSBA project, the MSBA would, prescribe who would be the committee overseeing the project. Uh, my understanding is that because it's not an MSBA project, it's it's up to us. And my suggestion is that it would continue to be the middle school building committee uh, for if for no other reason than expertise and continuity. Um, but I we did I, we did have an email exchange about that. And so it the town I think does have some choice in the matter, meaning the 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 small T town has choice in the matter. And like I said, I would suggest it it stay with the building committee. That's been my experience, but I would uh, obviously defer. <laughs> okay. All right, great. Um, thank you, Carmen. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, others on the committee who followed up. Uh, Louis Salemi. Did I say your last name right, Louis? Yeah. I'm sorry close. if I didn't. Thank you. Hi, please introduce Hi. yourself. Hi. Louis Salemi, um, 68 Great Motos. Um, just overall, um, I actually got up at town meeting and attended many of the um, feasibility study meetings and strong support of the project. 
However, my concern is, and as a former committee member on the building, um, um, on the CCHS uh, building project, your overall job as a committee member is to manage risk and to foresee the um, unexpected. And a 5% overall contingency estimate on a $100 million, $102 million project is just way too low. That number should be anywhere from eight to 10%. Um, I serve on the Library Construction Committee and I believe we started at 9%, um, and that's just basic conservatism. Uh, secondly, the ENR cost index is currently running up um, 10 to 11% currently, yet the estimators are assuming a 3.5%. It just seems to me from afar that everything is being done to get the estimate as low as possible and close to $100 million. It's not up to me to tell you what the appropriate number is, but I would urge you to have an estimate that has enough wiggle room in it, you know, when there are unexpected costs which are gonna arise, that you don't have to go back to the town for money. This is the last thing that you as a committee want to do. It'll be very ugly. The project will come to a halt. And if you're $8 million over, it's gonna end up being $16 million over by the time the project gets restarted. And just finally, as an example, on the high school project, our initial um, um, uh, hazardous materials estimate was $1.2 million. That number um, ended up being $3.6 million. We were able to absorb it because we had plenty of contingency that allowed us to absorb it. You're presently covering, I believe, $900,000. No, I can't speak to that estimate, but it's very easy for that 900,000 to turn into two to 3 million and your um, overall contingency essentially um, going away. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Bates. Good morning. Good morning everybody. You want to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Scott Bates of 52 Indian Spring Road. And I also served on the Willard School Building Committee years ago with Pat and others. Um, I uh, want to commend you for your progress. I really, I think those two reconciled estimates uh, seem very close. Uh, so great progress. Um, I just had two questions um, regarding uh, one being the soft cost. I looked at your old estimates from March of 2020 and I looked at the, um, the architect engineering costs and it came to like 8.9 million because you were including not only architecture costs but you were including testing, printing, admin, uh, your site geotech, site survey, all the other uh, all the other engineering costs and costs on top of the AE that were came to 8.9. I'm looking at your summary now and it looks like eight, I think it's like 8.8 uh, 8 million right, right now. Now I'm just curious, I wanted to know where that where is that 900,000? Where did that go? And uh, there was another cost in the soft cost from the previous estimate was the uh, miscellaneous project costs, utility company fees, commissioning, enhanced commissioning, project mailing, moving on. I don't know if those things just disappeared or not. So I had questions about those two things. And then the other thing, my other point was, um, you know, we're about, I'm in the business, we're dealing with uh, incredible uh, escalation right now. We've had 7% since May. We're dealing with big jumps in escalation right now. I just think, um, I'm just a little worried about the 5.25 escalation for the next 18 months. I just, the supply chain is not gonna end anytime soon. The crisis is gonna continue all the way through 2022. So I'm hoping it's gonna plateau, but I'm just, I think five is very conservative. And I hope it's, I hope you're right. Um, and uh, that, those are my points, but I really wanna know about really the soft costs and where that uh, $1.5 million went. I don't know if Ian or Peter can answer that. I think we're trying to stick to comments right now, Scott. I'll ask our designers to address anything that they're able to um, when we get through public comment, I guess. Um, this isn't, uh, I don't okay. know, how should okay. we do it? I just, no, in I the interest of time. That's fine. Um, That's fine. Thank you very is much. Is that okay, Scott? Hang, totally hang in there and I'll just Yeah, yeah, no, ask. I get it. I get it. Totally move uh, on. Thank you for Yeah, this. no, and these are great questions and we'll definitely get answers for you, Scott. So thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. Yep, I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, Hi, Joel. Joel Gagne. Hi, Joel Gagne at 31 Central Street. Um, I just kind of want to repeat some of the things I said at, at the workshop. Um, first of all, to the committee, great work. Thank you 
You guys have done just done a tremendous job. I want to reiterate that this this is a project that is is being used with a dirty word in America today, compromise. This was highly collaborative. No one got everything that they wanted. And I'm very proud of what the final result is. It's not it's not a Taj Mahal. Um, it's a functional school building for the 21st century. And I understand that, you know, we want to try to keep it to a number that was set back in 2019. I understand the concerns of, you know, trying to be too, too conservative. And I guess I want to encourage this committee um, to not make the mistakes that we have in the past of short term thinking. Um, we want this building to be functional for the next 20 to 30 years. And if, if you know, things go over, we'd rather be on the safe side of having a building that's functional and that's going to work 20 years from now than sitting and saying, why did we cut a corner here and nip and tuck there? We shouldn't want to do that. Again, this is not a Taj Mahal. This is a very green building. It's meant to be, meant to be sustainable and we want to make sure we do it right this time. And I know that what you have put forward is a project done right. And I just want to, again, thank everybody and the bottom line here is, is this has been a very public process and that's thanks to you guys. It's been a very public process and going forward, the public gets to have more of a say. This is the building that the community of Concord wants. Now the, the public process is that now the community of Concord now gets to decide if they want to pay for it. And we should put it forward as is uh, to, to the people of Concord and see if they want to, if they want to pay for it. I feel confident that they, that they will. And so I really want to encourage the committee not to make any reductions to this building um, and to, to, to have it go forward as is, because you guys have done a phenomenal job. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really appreciate all the work that you've done. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate everyone's comments. Were there any more before we move on? I want to... Keep the floor open for a minute. I'm looking around. Joel, your hand's still up, but I assume that's <laughs> a holdover. Um, awesome. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Great. Well, if there's nothing, then let's plan to vote next week on a number to put forward um, to the town for this particular project. So given all the information we have today and any recommendations that come out of um, sustainability and or answers to questions that the committee has for next week, let's um, all wrap our heads around, um, you know, what we want to put forward uh, as a final number on this. So thank you everyone for all the backup information, hard work that got us to where we are today. So, so much appreciation for all of that. And again, we'll do public comments at the end if there's anything more. Um, but just in the interest of time, I'm hoping we'll be able to be done by 10. So I'm trying to move things along in the interest of time. Uh, looks like our next agenda item is a photovoltaic scope. So I am going to ask that Stephen, Lori, and anyone else in the room, um, I think I saw Dave Wood on Stephen, maybe he's there if you need him, um, but to walk us through the photovoltaic scope, just so everyone knows, there was a decision made early on that we would be net zero ready as a building, which means have the in infrastructure in place to um, be able to receive photovoltaics um, at a future date and um, that the structure would support the photovoltaics Lorraine, if I say something incorrect or Ian, correct me, but we've got that. The structural can handle the weight and um, complications of putting a heavy structure on the roof. We're already there. We have conduits, we have feeds to electrical, we have circuit availability and infrastructure um, within the electrical system to receive that. We've got also conduits out to the parking um, locations where uh, canopies are presumed to be located. So all of that is within the numbers that were put forward to us today. So no additional anything needed to get us to that place. What is additional is the actual panels and you know wiring, et cetera. I think also footings and um, the, the structure needed at that parking would not be, is not included in that uh, cost today. That would come with the canopy structures. 
Um, but correct. anyway, thank you, Ian. Um, okay, so with that, just clear understanding of what's in the project versus what's future. Um, I'm going to turn it over. Is it Stephen? Are you prepared to talk through this, or do you? Yeah, I, I mean, generally, okay. sorry, Dave is okay. here and can fill in some of the details, but. <clears throat> um, and just so yeah. everyone knows, who's Dave? I David is, is, the, is the executive director of the um, municipal light plant, um, and he's here with us today. And he's really been kind of spearheading this this effort. Um, from a um, technical or from a um, you know titular standpoint, the town manager is a general manager of the light plant, uh, and so and also a member of this committee. So having that dual role, I've been able to to kind of link the conversations and feedback we get here in this space at these meetings about sustainability and energy efficiency and all that stuff. And also here, um, you know, the information that I talked to Dave and the light board about, uh, about the community's interest in, um, you know, renewable, generating renewable energy and using renewable, renewable energy to feed our electrical system. And so this project, uh, represents a, a great opportunity to, to do both things. And um, like I said, early on, we, you know, talked through what would it take and decided that the solar panels and, and, and a battery storage, you know, that we're looking at would be separate from the middle school project itself. Uh, it would be a CMLP project that would, like I said, provide for generation that would feed the grid uh, and provide storage capacity. Uh, one of the things we wanted to make sure we did was bring on a design consultant for CMLP early on in the process that would work with SMMA and Hill to make sure that there was integration from the very beginning. And that has happened. And, and I think SMMA is, was actually was, had worked with uh, its SDA as our, as our, our designer before. And so that <clears throat> it was pretty easy for them to get together. So um, that, like I said, I think we have a clear sense is that there is a concept design that includes uh, parking canopy panels and roof mounted panels, um, but it is it is conceptual. I mean, we have some you know conceptual idea of cost, conceptual idea of generation, but like everything on this project at this stage, you know, a lot more detail is needed to really know what the final uh, number is going to be. But I think we've been approaching this with a threshold of the community, even if it's not a part of what they're going to be voting on at town meeting in January. The community fully expects solar panels on these on on the building and on the site, and it's our it's our plan to deliver that. Um, so um, th that's kind of where we are now. Um, you know, I think, like I said, we it, it's at its early stages, and and I would, you know, uh, open it up for questions or turn it over to Dave if you have anything to add, Dave. Yeah, you know, I'll I'll uh, answer questions as they come up, but I think you did a good job giving the overview. So if you said this, I just want to repeat it, or if you didn't say it, I just want to say it. The reason this wasn't in the project is because it wouldn't fit within the budget numbers that we were talking about. Is that correct? Partially. Uh, you know, I, I think when we looked at this, we, um, you know, A, it is a, it's, a, it's an expensive project, uh, and the cost of the, of the project would be borne by the CMLP ratepayers, as opposed to the taxpayers who are bearing the cost of the middle school project. Um, but I also think it really is something that is, um, you know, it will be part of CMLP's assets. Um, now, there are solar panels on the Willard School as well, and the school does derive some savings benefit from having those panels there. And even though we haven't really started the conversation about what that would look like for the middle school, I fully anticipate that there'll be some kind of a, a arrangement similar to the Willard um, array. And, but we just haven't gotten to that place yet, but really it's, there's, and honestly, there's, as Dave will tell you, there's, there's a lot of different ways to design and plan, you know, before the meter, after the meter that we just haven't gotten to. Um, because it's just so early in the in the in the process, but um, you know, I think we have a lot of great options in front of us, um, and so that's why we are. That's why keeping it outside the project um, gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of how we approach um, the installation and the uh, management of it. Great, thank you. And everyone's fully intending on these 
being there when, <laughs> you know, if not at the completion of the project, at, soon after, right? Like the idea is that they would um, essentially follow along as we're designing and, and moving forward construction, that same process in, in parallel. And I know it's underway, so that's all great news. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, anything else anyone wants to say before I open up to questions from the committee? Okay, anyone have any questions? For Steven or Dave or Lori or myself, I'm probably the least knowledgeable as far as <laughs> CMLP. Hey, Matt, Matt Johnson, I see your hand. Yeah, so I know that the system includes uh, on-site storage. And so I'm wondering whether we could avoid putting in the diesel or natural gas generator and use the capacity from this, you know, the battery storage for backup power. So that's um, the battery backup wouldn't be um, sufficient to be a backup for this site for a long period of time. It'd be more of a four or five hour at most. Generally, battery storage is good between, you know, two and four hours. You can stretch it out a little bit. Um, so, you know, from, from a reliability standpoint, this should put a generator in um, if they want to have backup power and not um, plan on the battery being the backup. Just it's. Wouldn't that take us through a school day? No. 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 You, you get probably three to four hours out of a battery. That's about it. And Lorraine, for those in the room who don't know, what typically is on the generator? The generator is life safety. So, you know, a fire alarm, um, the elevator to bring it back down, although that can be done with batteries, um, but life safety components, the boilers, some of the switch gear. Um, I don't know how much in detail we do. We do both life safety and then just some backup so that we often try and keep the school in operation as long as possible. Um, you know, if power goes out. <laughs> Pardon? Freezers. <laughs> Freezers, right, right. You know, you want to be able to, to continue with that and continue school and not have to send kids home. So there are some other non-life safety components we typically put on the generator to try and help extend that day. But if, I mean, if the power went out at, you know, two in the afternoon, that's one thing. But if the power went out before school started, then, or, or even at, you know, 10 o'clock, then you'd be challenged with, is it going to survive for you? Is it going to come back? What do you do? How do you get kids out? Yeah, but I guess I'm thinking of if we're already contemplating having storage as part of the cost of the PV unit, then we could add incremental storage up to the cost of the generator capacity that we have budgeted. And so then that could create a, a battery storage system that would have potentially that additional capacity. I just you know, still looking at this as an opportunity, if we're already going to build some of that infrastructure, gosh, why not leverage it? Yeah, I, Matt, I mean, it's a good point. I think one of the things that you need to factor into the equation is cost. And, you know, for a battery, you know, of that size, you're talking millions of dollars, right? So when we look at that, that investment, you know, of a say, four megawatt battery that's going to last for four hours, you're talking close to $8 million. So, you know, you really have to balance what you do. Um, at least I do on the ratepayer side of things. You know, for a light plant to put in a battery just for a backup for the school is not the best use of the ratepayer's money. So we need to, you know, if we put I'm a battery- not suggesting in, that. I mean, I think that the no, storage would be only covered by CMLP to the extent that it's needed operationally. Right, and, and that's what we're looking at is you know, putting the battery in to offset transmission and capacity peaks. Um, that's the primary reason for our, uh, our interest in it. Yeah, I mean, it, one of the things Dave taught me is that um, to really be able to continue to have capacity for additional solar on people's homes and other places, there needs to be that capacity to absorb peaks uh, from generation and transmission. And that's really the battery is to do that on that side of the grid. Uh, so people over there can continue to add solar so we don't run out of capacity, not, not as a, um, you know, a facility to be connected to the school. Other questions? Oh, Chris, I yeah. see your hand. Yeah, hey, you also have to come in for winter. Oh. We have to have 
power there somehow so it doesn't freeze the school up, you know? Yeah. So we have to have heat and that requires electricity. So you have to have a backup to provide this and a battery doesn't. Yeah, I, 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 I'm sure Dave knows this as well as anybody. There's always this balance of getting too far ahead and getting locked into technology because battery technology is, is changing and improving, especially in high capacity storage and space and time and where, and if we build something where batteries can be added later based on you know fiscal picture and so forth, that might be something you'd think. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'd be very hesitant to try anything that says we can't have an emergency generator for all the reasons Lorraine and everybody has said. And I've, I've said from the beginning that, you know, make it uh, storage ready. It doesn't mean the storage device is going to be in there on day one of the school opening, but we have the ability to add it at any time. And that's that's really where I've been with the storage piece. Um, there's, you're right, you know, technology is changing and uh, it'll it'll be different by the time the school's ready. So, um, but I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to have the ability to add it there. You know, it's... it's it is attractive. Uh, we just have to work through the finances of it. Thank you, Dave and Chris. Any other questions? All right. I guess hearing none, we'll move on. Thank you for joining us, Dave. That was helpful and Stephen for the description and background. So. Yep. Well, um, John, John, yes. Yes. well, we have Dave here. Um, sure. I hate to put you on the spot, uh, but I'm going to put you on the spot. Maybe uh, a rough estimate of when this might uh, occur. Is this a uh, two to two to five year window? And I know this is uh, quite speculative. So you, I assume you're referring to the solar arrays, right? That's correct. Yeah. So, you know, we, we basically said we want the, the building and the site solar ready, but I fully uh, believe that it's going to be um, pushed by the community to have the solar installed um, as soon as possible. And, and so that's the way I'm looking at it at this point. Um, but as Stephen said, we are in the preliminary design phases and it's early on. We do have, um, you know, uh, size in the estimates. Um, we know what can be put on the roof, what can be put on the canopy. Um, yeah, so we, we have all that, we have costs, you know, we're doing, um, we have some more analysis to do in terms of what the cost per kilowatt hour is gonna work out to. Um, so there's a lot of pieces, a lot of moving pieces right now. Um, but, you know, I, I do believe that um, it'll be an earlier part of the project uh, opposed to five years after it's built. Got it. Thank you. Because I'm sure this will be uh, central to some of the town meeting conversations. Yeah, I think if I make, um, you know, I think a project of this size will likely require um, some debt uh, to be issued by the light plant to fund, and that would require a town meeting vote. And so there will be, um, uh, you know, obviously a community discussion about the project. And I think one of the things that will, I think, emerge through design development is the balancing of you know, site needs and space, you know, space parts of the site that may be available. Um, and as we, we get closer to, um, you know, um, building consumption needs versus how much can be generated on site to really get to that net zero place, uh, we'll, we'll really know more about how this is going to go and, and kind of balance out those factors. Um, so everything we've talked about here is going to be a part of the discussion going forward. It's just too soon to be able to say definitively, you know, it's going to require this many panels because the building's going to consume this much energy. So, um, but I think everybody, as Dave said, I think everybody in the community and the light plan um, understand, the, you know, what the expectations are. Great. I think the good news is we're, we're what, three plus years out from <laughs> completion if the schedule is, uh, um, you know, moving forward. So we, we have plenty of time to coordinate and collaborate and, and put this forward to the town. So I'm hopeful that this will all come together and that the PVs will be part of either the 
parallel construction or uh, right on the heels of it. So I'll remain hopeful. <laughs> From a just to speak on constructability, you know, from a constructability standpoint, this is something that can absolutely, if everything lines up, this can be coordinated. Um, uh, as as we're finishing up the building, the the PV arrays could be coordinated to go in um, as well and, and and have that infrastructure up front. So it it, it is a possibility. Great, and I'm willing to you know attend these meetings if you need me to going forward. Um, to give you updates on on where we are, but um, I appreciate you having me. Yeah, we appreciate you being here and we'll take you up on that offer because it's always good to have information out there and for all of us to be knowledgeable, um, even recognizing it's outside of our scope, but it's, uh, you know, so integral to our building. So it's important for us to stay informed and know what's going on. So thank you for that. Okay, and unless there's any other questions, I'm going to move on. Thanks for that. Uh, schedule and cash flow. I assume this could be a fairly quick update, Ian. Uh, yeah, honestly, um, I was focused on the estimate here. So schedule. <laughs> I don't think anything's flow, changed. No, no change. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Does anyone want a formal update? We heard it a couple of weeks ago and it, it's out there as far as I know. You guys met the SD deliverable. We got the estimates on time. They were reconciled in the time that was indicated. Yep. And here we are. So for me, it's status quo on the bulk. And then I assume the, the cash flow is the same as well. It's moving along like it has been. Yep, that's right. Okay. All right. Uh, we have new business on here twice. I got to know the first time. <laughs> I'll put it out there, but unless something's changed in the last hour or so, I'm going to assume there's no business. Okay, moving forward. Any other public comment? Anything related to PV? Anything anyone's thought of since we last had public comments on the um, cost estimates and value management log? I see Dean's hand up. I will invite you to speak, Dean. Good morning. Good morning, Dean Banfield, 73 Walden Terrace. I am the Finance Committee Observer to this committee. Um, uh, this has been a fine effort. I, I really want to commend everybody for every all the work that's been put in. This is a this has been a great meeting, also to just see exposed all the opportunities we have to you know meet our number. Uh, so that's great. But the comments I have really are focused today on so on the solar piece of the meeting. Um, I really think that when we voted to approve funds to get this thing going, that there were there was language inserted to say we're going to do a net zero building. And so the town is kind of expecting to see this come forward uh, with the intention of the net zero. So I think that the town would should be shown uh, some kind of some kind of images that show the site with the solar deployed. I also think that even though we don't have it yet, there ought to be some recognition of what the financial financial model is going to be for how we expect to proceed. They're just, we, we, we're doing a 100 million plus, it could be up to 102 based on today's meeting for the building itself. And, it, and then we just have a big question mark as to how the financing is going to occur to put this large set of arrays out. So I think that some work needs to be done between now and the special town meeting. So we have some kind of structural understanding of what the financial model is gonna be. And, and, and the question I have for, for, the, for the town manager or for Dave Wood now is how, are the, how is the financial model for, for, the, for the Willard arrays? Can we just mimic that and go for it? Can we just do that? I, I, I don't understand how those are paid for, what benefit the school derives from them. Can, can I get a quick update on how that's done? Thanks. Thank you, Dean. I don't know if Dave's still on. I know we yeah. checked in with them. We get a 10% 10 uh, 10 of the energy gathered, we get off the bill. So about $5,000 uh, monthly out of a $100,000 bill, not monthly, overall out of a $100,000 bill. So it's not formalized from what we can tell. So it might be a starting 
point for discussion, then we can go further and really work out the arrangement and document it. So, so, uh, so Stephen, does, do you have any understand? Is Stephen still on the call? Do, do yeah, you have any understanding? Yeah, what's the what's the how is the financial structure of the you know the implementation and then the follow on you know revenue streams etc that that support the Willard model? I, I because fundamentally what's going to happen it sounds like is the ratepayers who are the same people as the taxpayers are going to end up somehow uh, funding this this infrastructure either through increased Rate, utility rates or somehow. So even though our taxes aren't going up, our utility bills will go up. Some people will go up. So the, the money is coming out of the same pocket, basically. I disagree with that statement. I mean, I think there's a there's a there's a large number of overlap between ratepayers and taxpayers, but it's not all the same. Uh, and I, I'm not proficient in the Willard model. Uh, and I think Dave had a 10 o'clock that he had to go to. Okay. But I, I agree with you that we should do some work on you know maybe coming up with some scenarios some possible scenarios that could work i just don't i just want to part of my presentation today was to manage expectations about the level of detail and i think if we're going to ask people to vote on a hundred million dollar middle school um that we're not making numbers up about the solar stuff but i, I your point is well taken dean that um you know we do have like i said a schematic design um and some back of the envelope numbers that I think we can, you know, bring into the discussion, but um, I, I'm usually averse to doing that because then people kind of take those as gospel, and then when the actual numbers come out, sometimes there's a conflict. Well, I I I think that the original town meeting. I'll just restate the, the point, which is that the original town meeting voted for a net zero building. We segregated that into the net zero readiness of the project. And then a separate project to do the to do it, which is fine, but it it would just be it would just be prudent to come back to that same body and say, here's what we're going to do for the to get the building done, and here's here's what we're thinking, or here's here's what the scope is going to be for the other piece that you asked us to get going on, uh, and to 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 not have. Any kind of crisp statement about that is going to be a challenge for the meeting to uh, understand what the full picture is going to be. That's all. I'm 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 done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dean. This is this is hard work, and you guys are doing a great job. So thanks. Thank you, Dean. Appreciate your comments. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to have to take Russ and Jared with me and hop off the call. We've got a situation <laughs> at Thoreau, which is our other building project. Sorry. So, Please. I've made Justin yep. host and we'll certainly catch up on okay. the rest of the meeting. Thank you guys Thanks for everybody. all you do for the schools. Yep, thank you. I have to okay. leave. Okay, yeah, I was hopeful to be done at, at this point, but any other comments, public comments today? I will make a motion to adjourn to executive session, not to reopen. Okay, I will consider any seconds on that motion. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Um, let me call roll. Steve Crane. Yes. Uh, Jared had to leave us. Matt Johnson, I think, also had to leave us. Lori had to leave us. <laughs> Justin's still here. Justin. Yes. Uh, John Harris. Yes. Russ had to leave us. Peter Fischelis. Yes. Alexa was on off on yep, an airplane. I'm here. Yes. Oh my God. Hey. I'm back. All right. I'm landed. Uh, hey, Alexa. Okay. We're going. We're, you heard the motion? You bet. Okay. Did. Thank, thank you. Court? Yes. Thank you. Heather Bout? Yes. Uh, Frank Cannon? Yep. Chris Popoff? Yes. Charlie Parker? Yes. Thank you. Matt Root? Yes. Um, Pat Nelson? Pat's still with us? Maybe she had to step yes. off. Yes, no, I'm here. Oh, yep. oh hey, yep. Pat. Thank you. And I'm a yes. So thank you, everyone. We will go into executive session and then um, end the meeting. So appreciate everything from everyone. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Um, Don, am I, ending, am I ending this soon? You know, Justin, last time there was like magic and we all went into...
session. Um, maybe Aaron knows. Oh, we lost Lori like five minutes too early. Dude. She had a way. I can I give you the. It was, it was yeah. a breakout room. Yeah, it was like the way that the school committee do it that way, Court. She had yeah. a, a magic. So we can, that, we can go I, to breakout or we could ask uh, non members to exit. Um, yeah. I'm seeing that we have no non members in the group. So as long as we keep an eye on, uh, on the participants to enter, you've got an executive session de facto right now. Perfect. Okay. Well, I guess let's call it that because I don't have, and we're not recording. Do we need to stop recording or do we, we stop record? recording? Yes. Yes. We should stop recording. That's what okay. I thought. Okay. I'm pressing um, stop. I'm pressing stop on the recording. Okay.